Good morning. We thank God for the opportunity that we have to share with you on today. Another what I like to call Sunday School Lesson Preview Review uh, of the lesson as we share our lesson class on today. And many of you will have opportunity to share it again uh, on tomorrow. Uh, we're truly thankful for that opportunity that we have. Uh, honor and respect to uh, Pastor Meredith, Dr. Felker, as well as Sister Shirley Felker. Hope that you guys are doing well uh, on today. And we wish the best for you, as well as to Sister Alice Jones, who is our general superintendent of our Mount Carmel Missionary Baptist Church Church School, as well as uh, Sister Violet Crockett, who is not only the uh, youth division superintendent uh, of our church school, but she's also the chair uh, of our deaconess ministry. We hope that all is well with you all's families and everything uh, is well. Uh, also to all of the staff of our church school, as well as... Uh, the members of the Mount Carmel Missionary Baptist Church uh, and our friends and family of Mount Carmel who share with us. We thank God for you uh, being a part of what we're doing. Um, today's lesson title uh, in the commentary uh, is a call for the world's unbelief. Call for the world's unbelief. But as I did before, uh, what I'd like you to do is tell me what the Faith Pathways Quarterly title is. Uh, I'm really interested to see... Uh, what your Faith Pathways quarterly title is today. Type that in. Give you some time to type that in uh, as we get ready to go into today's lesson. Uh, while you're yet doing that, we want to call your attention to our devotional reading for today, and then we're going to open up with our invocation and then delve right in uh, to the lesson. Our devotional reading is coming from 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Actually, the A clause of verse 7. Again, that's 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 7a. And it reads like this in the language of the New International Version. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made of all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed to at the proper time. And for this purpose, I was appointed a herald and an apostle. And I am telling the truth. I am not lying and a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. Amen. The word of God for the people of God. Let us have our prayer for today. Gracious God, we thank you for allowing us this opportunity to come together and share. We ask that you would invoke your blessing upon us as we share in today's study and discussion of this lesson text. Continue to be with those who have logged in to be with us on today. Be with and continue to bless those who had a desire to be with us and cannot. Continue to keep all of us now. As in Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. Amen. All right. Okay. And standing in the gap. Okay, standing in the gap. I'll say excellent. Okay, that's an excellent, excellent. Very, very good. Appreciate you all sharing with us on today. Now, also, our key verse, and I know everyone has this one by heart. I know you know it by heart. And I know those that are members of Mount Carmel, I know you got this one. Uh, 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 whether you are Mary Powell, uh, whether you are uh, uh, Sister Christine Rouse, Ross, or whether you are uh, Deacon Irby, I know you got this one by heart. I know, and everybody in between, I know everybody. I know Carolyn Miller. I know you got this one by heart. Okay, everybody's got this one by heart. And I'm going to read it to you, John chapter 17, verse 20. And it reads like this. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who believe in me through their message. Amen. The word of God again for the people of God. Now, our lesson text today is coming from the 17th chapter of the Gospel of John, verses 14 uh, through 24. Again, that's John chapter 17, verses 14 through 24. Not a very long passage today, but a very, very good and pertinent passage uh, for us to discuss as it relates to talking about call for the world's uh, unbelief. Um, so by way of an introduction, let's take a look at a couple of things that I want to share with you. And that is this, first of all, Christmas, Mother's Day, Father's Day sometimes 
Easter, the first Sunday of the year, and the last Sunday of the year. Those are usually days that are of high attendance in most Christian churches. Now, however, with all of those first timers and with all of those returners that uh, that will go to church on those days, that go to church on Christmas, especially when Christmas falls on a Sunday, that will go on Mother's Day, Father's Day, Easter, first Sunday of the year, last Sunday of the year. You know what? Uh, there are still many people who will not be in church on those days. We will still, I mean, even though many of us, and I know some of you have said this, I'm not going to go to church because it's going to be all those people going to be in there that haven't been in church all year. And even with all of those folk in the church, as you're on your way to church, there's still folks standing on the corner. There's still folks walking the streets. There's still folks sitting on their porches or outside of their houses uh, that do not go to church, even on the highest attendance days uh, of the year when just about everyone that is a Christian is going to someone's church, whether it is because they feel they ought to or whether it's because they got a niece or a nephew or a child is giving a speech or whether it's some other issue uh, that may be at hand. We're going to uh, brunch with mama after service, whatever the case may be. Uh, with all of that going on, there are still folk that do not go to church. And you know, it's a reality, brothers and sisters, that some say that the church is too political. Some say the church is not political enough. Some say that the church has too many cliques in it. Some say the church is too restricted. Some say the church is not restricted enough. Some say the church is not safe. Some say the church is not welcoming. You know, and then there are those that will say that it's not the Christianity in the church that I don't like is the Christians. Somebody ain't going to get that till next week. Now, but brothers and sisters, having said all of this, it is the church, the church that is the body of Christ and the vehicle through which God is working to reach a lost world. What vehicle is he using to reach the lost world? He's using the church to reach that lost world. It becomes important for us to understand, brothers and sisters, that it can be discouraging to realize that many choose to avoid the church because they view the church as irrelevant or even hostile to their well-being or to their current lifestyle. Now, today's passage, John chapter 17, 14 through 24, is going to help us understand some things that sometimes we get a little confused on. For instance... John chapter 17, 14 through 24 will help us understand the difference between the model prayer of the Lord that he taught to his disciples and us uh, mistakenly labeled and called the Lord's prayer. That is the model prayer. The one that's in Matthew chapter six, verse nine through 15. Especially we take we take a look at that when placed next to what's actually the Lord's prayer. His prayer for the disciples in the world that is in John chapter 17. So in case we didn't know, and I know that sometimes uh, there are labels given to stuff and we understand. Yes, it is the Lord praying our father, which art in heaven. Yes, that's him saying that. But remember now, he's teaching them. The, he's giving them a model on how to pray. But here in today's lesson, the piece that we have here, because all of chapter 17 is actually the Lord's prayer. Of John, But what we have here in this segment is actually the Lord praying for his disciples as well as praying for the world. The Lord's prayer. OK, so if you did not know, now, you know. OK, so now as we continue on today, let's go right into today's lesson. Now, today's lesson starts uh, in John chapter 17. And the first section is going to be with verses 14 through 19, which is a big chunk, a good chunk and piece of today's lesson. And so uh, we're talking about in this particular lesson, the title uh, of the category is different like Jesus. OK, just like Jesus is different from the world. Guess what, brothers and sisters, as saints of God, as Christians, we are different from the world. But we have in this section, verses 14, 15 and 16, a session that talks about being kept from evil. I'm going to read that for you. John chapter 17, verses 14, 15, and 16. In the NIV, it sounds like this. I have given them your word, 
and the world has hated them. For they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Amen. Now listen to this. It has to be fantastic and frightening at the same time to know that the Son of God is praying to God the Father for your protection. I mean, it's fantastic that he's praying for my protection, but it's also frightening that he needs to, that he's asking to protect us because there are forces of evil out there that are actually trying to destroy us or inhibit who we are as saints of God. So now, listen to this. Believe me, if Jesus says that the world will hate you for no other reason than that you are a Christian, believe me, the world will hate you. If Jesus says you are no longer of the world, even though you are in the world, we need to govern ourselves accordingly. Because this is what, this is what he's telling you. This is what we are. As, as saints of God, as Christians, we are in this world. And that's not going to change until we're gone. But we're not to be of it. I wonder, do you hear what I'm saying to say? Now, but also believe me, if Jesus says, or if he petitions the creator, that's God the Father, to protect you from the destruction of Satan, you need to know that Satan may hurt you, but Satan cannot destroy you. And you know, a hallelujah ought to go right there. Because, you know, Satan will try to stop us. Satan will hurt us. But thanks be to God, Satan, God will not let Satan destroy you. Did you hear what I said? I want you to hear what I said one more time. Jesus will not allow Satan to destroy you. Doesn't mean you won't get hurt. Doesn't mean you won't get inhibited. But he won't destroy you. I thank God for that good news. So now, we go from being kept from evil as Jesus is praying to God the Father in this prayer. We'll, we go to verses 17, 18, and 19, which talks about, us, a dog talks about being sent to the world. Now, I want to read verse 17, 18, and 19 for you here. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. Amen. Now, it's important for us to understand today, brothers and sisters, that sanctification is both intentional and purposeful. We'll repeat that again for you. Sanctification is both intentional and it is purposeful. Listen, when we accept Christ as Lord and Savior, God begins the process of sanctifying us. We become sanctified. What does that mean? It means to make holy. It means to set apart. That's intentional. You see, don't be afraid of being holy, for it simply means that God has his hands on you. That's what holy means. It means God has his hands on you. And if God has his hands on you, you're holy. You know, and so remember now, but there's an intentional process of sanctification, of being sanctified. But there's also a purposeful uh, process of being sanctified. And we'll deal with that now. So see, God is preparing you for something. He's preparing you for something somewhere. And that is the purposeful aspect of sanctification. That is the purposeful aspect of being sanctified. Remember, the intent, the intentional aspect is to be set apart, to be, to be made holy, for God to put his hands on you and begin to make you into what he wants you to be. But then there is the purposeful part of it where he's preparing you for something somewhere. Maybe it's where you are now. Maybe it's not. But not only that, Perhaps you've been a Christian long enough already to know what God's purpose is for you. But perhaps not. If not, allow the Holy Spirit to continue to work on you and, and yield to his guidance for his purpose that he has for you. It's intentional and it is purposeful. Remember now, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Spirit, however you want to refer to him as, he makes us into what God wants us to be as what? As a witness and as a testimony to who? The same world that we came out of. Isn't it interesting? God sends us back. Yes, he does. He sends us back 
amongst the same people amongst us and within the same world that he brought us out of in order to be a witness, in order to have a testify, in order to have a testimony. And it be, it's important for us to understand that that's the whole idea of being sanctified, to being made holy and set apart with a purpose. All right. Now, we take a look at uh, the next category of verses here as we're talking about now being united as one. Well, we're now still in John chapter 17, but we're dealing with verses 20 through 24. Now, and before we get to verse 24, we want to deal with verse 20, 21, 22, and 23. And talking about united with one another as Jesus is saying this in his prayer to God the Father. Listen to this. Beginning at verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray for, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one father just as you and you are in me and I am in you may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me verse 22 i have given them the glory that you gave me so that they may be one as we are one i in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Amen. Listen, the faithfulness of the church, which is what the success of the church is. Remember, God didn't call us to be successful. He calls us to be faithful. And so our faithfulness is our success. But now the faithfulness of the church, which is a success, cannot be achieved without unity. We can't be faithful. We can't do the things that God would have us to, be, to do and be without unity. That's important. The blessed trinity of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost now becomes an, the example of unity that we must learn to express. When Jesus says, Lord, I pray that they become one just as we are one. Well, we know that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost are one. And it becomes important for us to understand that he's praying that we, the church, we, the saints of God, we, the body of Christ, become one as he is one. That becomes important for us to understand. Now, it's not enough that we're united with Jesus. We're to be united with one another. And I think that becomes very, very important because, see, it's not enough to just have a relationship, a personal relationship with Christ uh, and understand that. But it's important for us to understand that we're to be united with one another, laterally as well. The cross has two pieces. The cross not only has the vertical piece that goes between ourselves and God, but the cross also has a horizontal piece that goes across and goes from you to me, or from person to person, from brother to brother, from sister to brother, from sister to sister. It becomes important for us to understand that not only is there the vertical aspect of what Jesus has done for us and expects of us, but then there is the horizontal aspect of what Jesus has done for us and he expects for us as well. So again, it is not enough <clears throat> that we are united with Jesus. We're to be united with one another, especially among those who are not like us. That becomes a challenge, whether it is of racial difference or color difference or difference of creed. God calls on us to be united with one another. Martin Luther King said on many years ago, he says the most most uh, segregated time uh, in America is on Sunday morning doing morning worship at 11 o'clock or whenever morning worship is, because that's the time when most of the time people are not witnessing or reaching out to people of a different race of a different color, and of a different creed. But brothers and sisters, if we're going to be the saints of God that God has called on us to be, and if we're going to utilize the church, which is the vehicle that God has left on record for us to use to reach the lost, we're going to have to reach those of different races, different colors, and different creeds. Amen. Now, because now we go to verse 24, which basically deals with being united with Christ. And I'll read that passage for you where it says, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Amen. 
Now, it becomes important for us to understand here, brothers and sisters, that the disciples would get a chance to see the resurrected Christ in all of his pre-creation glory. But guess what? One day we shall as well. It becomes important. He said it. He's, he said it to the Father. He said, Father, I want those you have given to me to be with me where I am and see my glory. The glory you have given me because you have loved me <clears throat> before the creation of the world. And so it becomes important for us to understand, just as the disciples would have a chance to see the resurrected Christ in all of his pre-creation glory, we shall have that opportunity as well. Well, now, today, as we take a look at the conclusion points that I want to share with you on today, the there are a couple that I want to share with you, and they're these. Now, we, uh, in the somewhat religious safety of America, do not very often feel or get threatened while living, witnessing, and testifying uh, our Christianity, okay? We've been very fortunate to a point in that regard uh, in America. However, we do engage people who call themselves Christians who will work to hinder our growth, who will work to ignore our witness, and will work to try to silence our testimony. It becomes important for us to understand that, that reality. The, though we don't have the obvious challenges and dangers of being put in prison or being executed because we are talking about Jesus, because we are having Bible studies, because we are preaching and teaching, it becomes important for us to understand that uh, we do engage people who call themselves Christians who work to hinder our growth. They work to hinder your growth. They work to ignore your witness. They use a lot of energy to try to silence your testimony. And they'll use terms and they'll use phrases like these. Okay, here they come again. Okay, here comes the church man, or here comes the church lady. Uh, why are you always trying to push that church stuff on me? Or, my all-time favorite, uh, I believe in God, I just don't do the church thing. Okay, it becomes important for us, brothers and sisters, to understand this. While engaging challenge, we need to be confident in knowing that Christ is with us, giving us the strength that we need to endure the hindrances, to withstand the ignorance, and to push past the attempts to keep us silent. Amen. We hope you've been blessed and helped by today's uh, sharing of the lesson. We look forward to you sharing with us on tomorrow uh, as we have worship via Facebook uh, live again uh, at 11 a.m. Uh, right here from this uh, particular area uh, of our uh, church facility. Uh, we thank God for all of you that continue to support us as well as uh, view us and share with others. We want you to also know that uh, today's lesson will also be on YouTube today. So if you tell your family and friends that aren't on Facebook that they can go to YouTube if they have a computer or a smartphone and uh, they can subscribe to our channel. It's Mount Carmel Missionary Baptist Church Dash Bronzeville. And if they subscribe, they'll get notifications whenever we post they get a notification letting them know that we're on. So we look forward to you sharing with us uh, in those endeavors. I'm so thankful for our camera person, uh, Sister Jones, being with us on today. Say good morning, Sister Jones. Good morning. And so continue to be with us. Continue to pray for us. And until next time, take care and God bless.